Hey y'all, Uncle Jimmy here. When you speak for yourself, you're forced to think for yourself. And when you think for yourself, the sports world looks different. In order to enjoy this podcast and this show, you need to have the courage to look at the world from alternative points of view and not be offended when you disagree. Speak for Yourself isn't your Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram feed. SFY tells you what you need to hear and not what you want to hear. So, welcome aboard, buckle up, and enjoy the ride. We start with Thursday Night Football. All right, the hardest thing to project about the modern professional athlete is his finish line. What is he really running toward, greatness or goal? It's easy to say an athlete can run toward both. But a lot of times there's a fork in the road or there's an alternate route that gets you to the gold slightly ahead of greatness. And once you have your pot of gold, do you lose interest in the race? The truth is, in football, decision makers and members of the media are quick to reach the conclusion that a black player prioritizes gold over greatness. This isn't strictly a byproduct of racial bias. It's a reflection of a prevailing narrative. The general belief is black players come from poverty, and poverty will certainly make you crave gold. We assume the white players, particularly the quarterbacks, come from privilege and experience less financial pressure. I bring all this up because I feel we might have missed what's obvious about San Francisco quarterback Jimmy Garoppolo, who faces the Arizona Cardinals tonight on Thursday Night Football. Jimmy G's finish line is paved with gold and that quite possibly explains why he hasn't lived up to the expectations set by the $137 million contract he signed in 2018. Jimmy G strikes me as the kind of athlete who has crossed his personal finish line. I'm not sure if greatness matters as much to him as having a good time. He's loose with the football and his decision making. I took a lot of heat when I said that his decision to frolic around Beverly Hills with a porn star said something about Jimmy G as a football player. He's loose. Yesterday, Pro Football Focus asked a relevant question concerning Jimmy G. Is he holding the 49ers back from the Super Bowl? PFF pointed out that Garoppolo has a penchant for making quick, bad decisions and throwing risky passes into tight windows. PFF says against man coverage on throws in 2.5 seconds or less, Jimmy G is the worst quarterback in football. He's loose. His TD to interception ratio is 9 to 7. He's being carried by San Francisco's defense, running game, and head coach Kyle Shanahan. Garoppolo is the weak link in the 49ers Super Bowl plan. You can't turn a loose man or woman into the perfect spouse. Mm. Lord knows I've tried. Jimmy G (laughs) will ultimately cost this San Francisco team a Super Bowl appearance. All right, joining the desk now are Fox Sports NFL analyst Mark Slareth and LeVar Arrington. Marcellus, I'll start with you. Yes, please. Will Jimmy G ultimately cost the 49ers a Super Bowl appearance? Absolutely not. Uh, Jimmy G has uh, a set of circumstances that get lost when you talk about him as an overall talent. We all know he's coming off the ACL injury, and they usually predict that a guy will be himself in two years, not one year from that injury. Two, He's missing his two starting offensive tackles. Three, he had no receivers until one landed last week, and as soon as he landed off the plane, he got a touchdown in Emmanuel Sanders. Also, if we're talking about Jimmy G in terms of expectations and growth when it comes down to the playoffs and the Super Bowl run, let's also compare him to some quarterbacks, great ones and not, who had subpar playoff runs and still were Super Bowl champions. Everyone wants to pick on our man, Trent Dilfer, and I'll be the next to do it, even though he's my man. Uh, we all know what Trent Dilfer did in the playoffs during his run, and he started eight games, so he didn't even play the entire season, so chemistry could have been an issue. 12 touchdowns, 11 interceptions. Let's go to Tom Terrific, Tom the Great, the GOAT. Last year we saw him in the playoffs, two touchdowns, three interceptions. Uh, let's talk about him when his early years, when Tom the Terrific went out there and averaged The first Super Bowl run, under 200 yards, one touchdown, and one interception, and got it done. This is the most balanced team in the NFL when we talk about the San Francisco 49ers. Number one defense and number six in terms of offense. No team has greater balance. Jimmy G will peak at the right time and lead this team in the playoffs. I think one of the things you have to understand about Jimmy G is, think about this now. You know that that Baker Mayfield has more starts than Jimmy G? Mm. Mm. Jimmy G got a contract 
And all of a sudden, because he'd been behind Tom Brady, all of a sudden we thought, oh, okay, he's ready to roll. There's still a, still a huge learning curve going on with Jimmy G. Jimmy G has got some great arm talent. Jimmy G is going to make three mistakes a game. That's what he does. Now, as you grow and as you mature and as Kyle Shanahan continues to coach this team and put them in the right position, do you get to the point where you're mature as the playoffs roll around? Are you peaking as the playoffs roll around? This is a talented football team, and I will tell you, you're right. You're not only down to your backup tackles, it's your fourth and fifth offensive tackle, and you're, and you, you're minus the best fullback in all of football yeah. in Kyle Juszczyk. He's one of the most, one of the most uh, just tough matchups in all of football. So I look at this like there's still a learning curve going on. Jimmy G is not going to cost them a chance at the Super Bowl because I don't believe Kyle Shanahan will let Jimmy G cost them mm -hmm. a chance at the Super Bowl. Mm. Not only will he not cost them, but he's one of their strongest links. On oh, this team. cut it he's out. He's not a weakest link. He's a <laughs> strongest link. Let's think about this for two seconds. Mm. In your Whitlock, you just you just talked about how he was gallivanting around with, with uh, an phone. adult star, yeah. Yeah. adult film. Film maker, model. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, At night. <laughs> we're using those things in, in a derogatory manner, a, a, a yeah. devaluing of sorts, right? Yeah. Now, let's, let's look at this and let's flip this around and let me bring uh, – do y'all for two seconds, all right? Mm. The fact that he's comfortable enough to do it <laughs> means that Jimmy Garoppolo is actually comfortable enough with himself, all right? In today's society, in our culture, Ooh. we're driven by trying to get the validation from you and you and you and me and other people. It doesn't seem as though he is, mm -hmm. okay? So when you have a quarterback, when it seems as though this, this Niners team has been able to put the process in place. They had a structure. They have the process. They have a game plan. Know your role. The fact of the matter is Jimmy Garoppolo is probably the biggest link that they have, the strongest link that they have, because he's not trying to be Tom Brady. He's not trying to be Aaron Rodgers. We don't hear about him trying to get the, the accolades and, and the headlines that some of these other guys out here are getting. He is playing his role. And for that, for, for the defensive side of the ball to get the headlines and be talked about and praised the way and revered the way that they are. And he's just going right about his business along the road, doing what Jimmy G does. Good for him and good for the Niners team. I think they're okay. Some Woo! of your best work. Some I, of your best work. I love that. I disagree with it because I think all of y'all are, are forgetting who else is in the NFC. And so at some point in these playoffs – He's going to line up against Drew Brees or Aaron Rodgers or Russell Wilson, and they're going to make His better. His defense is going to line I up against I get it, them. but that, the matchup right. of quarterback, okay. and they're going to make consistently better decisions than Jimmy G, and he's going to do something silly and stupid and loose with the football because he plays footloose and fancy free in all aspects of his life. He's going to do something, turn the ball over, and cost him a game. They've been getting away with it. The defense has been carrying him. I get it. But eventually, a quarterback that throws this many interceptions when he's really not even called upon to carry the team, the running game, the defense, the whole nine yards, he keeps finding a way to throw these bad interceptions. The, the pro football focus has broken down the film, the stats, the whole nine yards. The guy's too loose with the football, and it's going to cost him against one of these better quarterbacks. Well, when you're missing your tackles, when you're missing your fullback, you're under a certain duress. When you don't have a receiver out there that you really can depend on, obviously you don't have that same outlet. That's why Kittles comes into play so much at the tight end position. But I really want to, I want to abstract something from this situation looking at Jimmy G in terms of his value. What were the 49ers before Jimmy G? Whatever we want to talk about in intangibles, the problem with intangibles is they're impossible to measure. Mm -hmm. But there is one way you can say, well, he brings something to the equation beyond production because look what they were in terms of culture and success before and after him. Mm -hmm. So the season before Jimmy G, 2-14. and 14. Then he's sitting there while they're 1-10. and 10. And then he says, let me go out there and play. And what's our happening? They won five straight, goes into the offseason, gets his money. And not only does he get his, get his money, he's trying to live his own life his own way. His own way. Not living up to that number, not going out there pressing and doing too much for that number, but doing whatever Jimmy G wants to do. So I have respect for a guy who was inserted into a losing situation, and now it's an undefeated situation. Yeah, I, I will say this, you know, and, and 
has he made some mistakes and has he missed some plays? Yeah. I mean, most everybody does, right? I mean, that's, that's, part, of yeah. the, that's part of the growth process. And so does he need to play better? Yeah, to your point, he does need to play better. There's no question about that. But I, I look at this team in totality. Great quarterbacks don't win Super Bowls. You know what wins Super Bowls? Great football teams. I'm glad you throw that out there. That, great football teams win Super Bowls. Peyton Manning had, what, nine, nine touchdowns and 15 picks when they went to the Super Bowl and mm. they won it mm. based upon a defense. And, like, those – the great teams are the teams that win Super Bowls. And let me just tell you, from top to bottom, this is a great football team. They dominate the line of scrimmage. Their, their blocking schemes, what they do with their motions, the angles they get in the blocking game and the running game, second to none right now in the National Football League with what they're doing and their defense. Their, listen, man, for D. Ford, first rounder. Eric Armstead, first rounder. Buckner, first rounder. Uh, Nick Bosa, first rounder. Solomon Thomas, who was the third overall pick in 2017, Solomon Thomas is a 20-play-a-game guy rotation. They, in a rotation. I mean, they are... They are stacked. And you got to credit John Lynch mm. and Absolutely. Kyle Shanahan. And again, you know, again, it was some great stuff. But to call him their strongest link, I mean, my God. But Kyle Shanahan is the best play designer and play caller going in football. We, Matt Ryan has fallen apart without him. And without their leader at the quarterback's position being that extension of what Kyle Shanahan represents, he becomes the weakest link. Just in, just in the same manner, he becomes their strongest link. He is an extension of Kyle Shanahan. L listen, you look at Trent Dilfer. Trent Dilfer was an extension of Bill uh, of uh, Billick, Billick, right? Yeah, he, what, would we call him the most elite quarterback in that 2000 season where they went and won the Super Bowl? I'm not saying you have to be the best quarterback. But you did say when what they I'm go saying against is these this guy, other elite yeah, quarterbacks. He's mistake-prone, and it's going to bite him in the rear end. So was end. Trent Dilfer. So was, so was uh, let, let me ask. Let me ask you this. These guys instead weren't of, elites. Instead of looking at the quarterbacks, let's look at the coaches in the NFC. Okay? Yeah. All right. So – Kyle Shanahan versus what, LaFleur? I like Kyle Shanahan. Okay, Kyle Han Shanahan versus? Sean Payton. Sean Payton? I like Sean Payton. Sean Payton. Okay. Pete, Pete Carroll. Carroll. That's a draw. I like Pete Carroll. Okay. Well, he's got you got the experience. Yeah, you want to do the segment over, Mark? <laughs> <laughs> no. You don't no, want to name them. I mean, the NFC coaches are Don Dottas. Because, yeah. because I, I would say Sean Payton and, and Kyle Shanahan are pretty, are pretty similar. Um, Sean Payton. Eventually, he may be on Sean Payton's level, but, but not, not right yet. now. Yeah, not right now. I mean, he, he may prove to be. He may be right now. Okay. But we haven't seen enough evidence the best no, for me to but, go there. But I'm just saying, right now, the way the, the, way the games are currently constructed yeah. and, and with mm. what we've seen this season, mm. is there anybody that's coaching a team better right now than what Kyle Shanahan no. has coached? Has been okay. better no. educated throughout the Let, course of the entire We're all life. in agreement on Kyle <laughs> Shanahan. All right. Really? I'd just I, rather I, have Drew Brees. That's who Sean Payton's working with. Then Jimmy G. Well, look at the stability at the coaching position. Credit to John Lynch once again. Four, they had four different coaches in four years before they finally said, we got Kyle Shanahan, we solidify that position. And to that tune, Jimmy G is only second to Ben Roethlisberger in his first 17 starts in mm -hmm. terms of wins. Only second to Ben Roethlisberger. Congrats to the Nationals on their first ever World Series title. I have more to say about the turning point in last night's Game 7 when A.J. Hinch pulled Zach Grinke mm. later on. But right now, LeVar Arrington is back, and we're joined now by Fox NFL analyst T.J. Hushmanzada. Time for a big story sponsored by KFC. Come enjoy our new Kentucky Fried Wings in Buffalo Honey Barbecue and Nashville Hot. <laughs> All right, let's move to Le'Veon Bell, mm. who was rumored to be one of the Jets players who could be on the trading block before this week's deadline pass. Le'Veon didn't get moved, but today he claimed that there was a surprising team among his many suitors. There was a lot of trade speculations and rumors about me getting traded, obviously, from the Jets to other multiple teams, and they were actually true. There were times where um, I found out from my agent, um, you know, he had talked to the Jets and and things like that, but it was teams like uh, like Houston, the Packers, the Kansas City Chiefs, and surprisingly, the Steelers were all in the mix of trying to trade for me. All right, what's most interesting here, the Jets shopping Le'Veon or the Steelers being interested in Le'Veon <laughs> returning? Uh, it's the Steelers being interested. Um, for them to keep their business hat on and not get emotional about this situation, and I think a lot of people have to remember that Le'Veon Bell didn't 
wear out his welcome with the Steelers. He just stopped coming over to the crib, you know, because he wanted more money. So they were like, all right, well, there's not really damage done here. It's just you got to do what you got to do. I respect that. And then you look at the Steelers situation and start to dissect them, especially in the running game. 31st in the rushing attack last year. And even this year, before the Monday night game against the Dolphins, James Conner was averaging three yards a carry. So you still look at him now, he's still sub-average in 3.9 yards a carry. So their running game has not given them support. Now with a Ben Roethlisberger out, and you got a backup quarterback trying to find his way, you want someone like a Le'Veon Bell who can go out there and do it all for an offense. He's in tremendous shape being underutilized with the Jets and not properly supported by Adam Gase and their passing attack. So I think that Pittsburgh was interested in getting what they had before. Yeah, I'm with you. It was the Steelers. It was when he said it, though. Normally, he knows when he says the Steelers are interested. You normally would say that team first. And he was like, oh, surprisingly, the Steelers, it's 100%. It kind of reminds me of a story you've told before where you had some girlfriend and you realized you made a mistake and you tried no. to get her back and it was like, no. it's over. You messed up because you tried to holler at her friend. Mm. It's like, mm. you had him. Or your cousin. <laughs> okay, there we go. Like, <laughs> you had him. Oh, man. And you let him go and you realize, like, yeah. ah, we really need this guy. And James Conner doesn't bring the same dynamic ability that Le'Veon Bell's is. When you look at the Steelers' offensive line, they're still one of the best offensive lines in the league, and James Conner's just not getting it done via the run game or the pass game. Mm. And what this really shows me is in the offseason was a lot of talk of who was worse for the team, Le'Veon Bell or Antonio Brown. This shows you right here, if this is true, Le'Veon Bell wasn't a problem. Right. It was just a financial situation or financial dispute that went on. But as far as his standing in that locker room with his teammates and the coaches, he was never a problem at all for them to want him to come back. Yeah, I'm going to check that box off as well. And, and here, here's my take on it, all right? I wrote down, education is more valuable than money, all right? So he wanted the money. This has been a money issue for him. He sat out for the money. The Steelers allowed him to, to go experience and get that education elsewhere. So it goes back to the girlfriend with the cousin uh, type of uh, analogy, right? You get an opportunity to see what another environment is like. You get an opportunity to experience it, learn it, and now you're realizing that it isn't as good as you had it where you were currently at. Mm. So for the Steelers to reach back out, I don't think it was, yeah, you know, now you know type of, of throw it in your face type of deal. It was more or less in this moment, you needed to learn and understand that your your best days were with this Steelers system and with these people here. If you need to go out and, and figure out that this is where you should be, let's gauge it. And now you have the education. We, we're not going to give you more. We're not going to give you the money you were asking for. But, but maybe now you'll realize that being in a, a great situation that doesn't necessarily financially meet exactly what you wanted may outweigh the the ladder of getting that check you wanted. I'm going to go a different direction and say I find two things fascinating. Adam Gase, to me, still doesn't want Le'Veon Bell, yeah. and that's why they were listening to mm. offers and perhaps trying to shop him out there. But my number one takeaway from this is, like, the Steelers will not give up on this season, and I don't understand why they won't. Mm. They Mason Rudolph's out there at quarterback. You're not winning anything of significance without Ben Roethlisberger. They gave up a first-round pick for Minka Fitzpatrick. You know, and look, maybe he'll be a great long-term player for him, but all of this desperation about this season, to me, screams. They got a gun to Mike Tomlin's head, man. They're try mm. They are trying to say, look, hey, Mike, we did all we could. We got to let you go. That, that's what this screams to me more than anything. We got to make a fish pattern. We tried to bring Le'Veon Bell back. We refused to give up on this season. I don't get it. Why not take a step back, go out and draft your running back, go out and draft your quarterback? You have a chance to rebuild without having to announce a rebuild once you lost Ben Roethlisberger. I don't get it. Well, all things were stated that Coach didn't have personnel control. So if Coach doesn't have personnel control, even with a gun in my head, what can I do? So this, this actually screams that upstairs there's a different desperation. As you start to look at the – There you go. You know, you start they to look – They still have a chance. They still got a chance. Yeah. You look at the AFC, obviously Buffalo – I'm talking about wild card situation. Buffalo is sitting there with two losses. Pittsburgh with four losses. Houston with three losses. And a bunch of teams are sitting there like – 
like right Houston, there, with four losses. So there's only two teams ahead of them for the wild card. Think about that. And what and, are they gonna do when they get there, though? That's get my smoked point. out the out the building. <laughs> they they just want to get there. They but get they want to get there. And I, and I think your point is is I don't want to take away from yeah, your point, quick. but I think it's a good point to to realize that I don't think it's dire to get rid of Mike Tomlin. I think that they're a champion, and a champion and a winner wants to win, and they're gonna never give up until it's done. LeVar Arrington and TJ Husponzada are back. Let's move to Baltimore, where the Ravens host the undefeated Patriots Sunday night. And while I've been hyping Lamar Jackson and company all week, they seem to be doing a pretty good job of that themselves, with tight end Nick Boyle saying, New England has never seen anyone like Lamar Jackson, and defensive tackle Brandon Williams guaranteeing they give New England the run for their money. All right, I'm a little bit concerned that uh -oh. the Ravens are over. That doesn't change my bet. Call no. your bookie. It's I'm already in. in huh? My money's already Call in. I'm on bookie. the money line. <laughs> uh, but I am a little concerned about overconfidence here. Mm. I don't see this as overconfidence. I, I see this as Devin McCourty did, which was just matter of fact. He was just like, yeah, they have a tremendous weapon that we're going to have to deal with. And it's amazing that uh, many times in our world, when you have something great or you are of greatness, if you don't understate that, people think that you're cocky. Case in point, I was at this premiere last week, and this guy, I'm going to leave his name out of it, is not rich. He's wealthy. <laughs> so we're at the premiere. It's getting late. People crowding around him. They don't even know who he is, just talking. They're like, oh, you know, everybody's just shooting it. And they say, so what time's your flight? And it's late. And he was like, oh, it's a little bit later tonight. And they were sitting there perplexed because it was like 10-something. Well, you better like, get to the airport. You better get to the airport. I ain't going to that airport I to want, when he flies. I, I wanted to just, like, telepathically tell him um, the plane leaves when he gets yeah, there. Right. One of those things. <laughs> right. But he was forced to be understated, so he didn't come off as cocky. Right. And this is the same thing. Look, I got Lamar Jackson. I'm just going to tell you, we got Lamar Jackson. Do you right. understand what that means? And Devin McCourty took it like I would take it. They got something tremendous over there. Enough said. It's exactly what you said. Nick Boyle, he says they haven't seen anybody like Lamar Jackson. Devin McCourty comes out and says the same thing. Regardless if you're overconfident or not, you still got to play. Hmm. Everybody in that Baltimore Ravens locker room 100% feels like they're going to win the game. They feel like they're going to beat New England. Whether that happens or not, you have to approach it that way with the utmost confidence. Now, New England, how are they going to play this? They haven't seen anybody like Lamar, but Ooh. history has shown us Bill Belichick is not going to let Lamar Jackson beat him. And if he, if he can do that, then Lamar Jackson's on his way to being very, very special. I don't look at it as being overconfident. I think that they are trying to hype themselves to, to raise to rise to the occasion mm. of playing against this, this machine, as I'm, I referenced them. The one thing I kind of don't like about it more than if, is it overconfident – I don't like them putting it out there. And, and here's why I'll say I don't like them putting it out there, because if you feel as confident as you feel, you feel as good about the, the no need to state the fact that what you have in Lamar Jackson, approach the game with, with that, that sense of we're going to come out here and we're going to punch them in the so mouth you're and we're going to do what we're doing. That leads you to this answer. Yeah, I, you just, I still, for me. You wouldn't do it. For me, for me, hmm. for me in, this, in this scenario, because I do think the Ravens actually are a team that matches up as well with the Patriots as any other team after taking a step back when I listened to your commentary on them and, and really, really dissecting them. I just don't think you should give Bill Belichick and this team any unnecessary ammunition coming into the game. And Here's my issue. There's going to be 47 guys on the active roster. All 47 of them need to feel like I got to do my part. I got to be on my A game. When I hear this, <laughs> man, we got Lamar. Right. And Watch Lamar. Well, we got, we get him, Lamar. Lamar. Get him, <laughs> get him Lamar. Got Lamar. <laughs> and to me, everybody that's going to be active needs to go, no, no, they got me, and I'm about to handle my business. Of course Lamar is going to do his thing because that's what Lamar does. But, but I, I, again, why it's overconfidence. Like, man, we got Lamar. They ain't got, no, ain't got nothing for Lamar. That's the overconfidence that scares me because it really ain't mm. a confidence in yourself. It's a confidence in one guy. And football, man, it, it takes all 47. Belichick started this. It's the second time Belichick's been on record saying uh, he's a problem. He's fast. He's going to outrun everybody. He's a problem. 
Finally, the players are saying, yeah, we have something that is called a problem. And, and the dynamic that's going on mentally is not overconfidence. It's the fact that people want to hold on to the power and distribute it like they want to. Case in point. I got another little story. Beautiful woman I used to go to school with by the name of Tiffany Cambridge. Hi, I, Tiffany. Ooh, hey, <laughs> Tiffany. Ninth grade. When Tiffany walked in the room and didn't say anything, everybody was like, oh, my God. She got to be fine She's... for you to remember her from the ninth grade. <laughs> oh, 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 yeah, yeah. You I'm Google sorry, her. Go She's ahead. still fresh. <laughs> um, everybody would say, oh, she's so pretty. Tiffany's so beautiful. Too pretty. The day Tiffany started to walk in, like, I am pretty. I am beautiful. Ugh, she thinks she all that. Here's the thing. Wait a minute. Why do you need the power to put the label on me? Belichick put the label on them. It's fine. When they finally say, yeah, you know what? We do have something special. Oh, what you thinking? Lamar Jackson going to win the game by himself? <laughs> Amazing how we always flip it on people. It's the same reality. Brilliant right. to Belichick. Before we Shout go, to Tiffany, Shout to I'd like to tell Houston Astros <laughs> manager A.J. Hinch that not only did he blow the World Series last night, he ruined a movie I'd been watching since 2004. The Zach Grinke story was exactly 11 outs from a heartwarming, happy ending that would rival Kramer versus Kramer and Shawshank Redemption when Hinch emerged from the dugout and rewrote the ending. In the top of the seventh inning, Hinch overreacted when Grinky walked Juan Soto after giving up a solo home run to Anthony Rendon. Grinky wasn't in trouble. He'd just thrown 80 pitches. The walk to Soto was a byproduct of an umpire error earlier in the at-bat. The Astros were leading 2-1 when Hinch pulled Grinky during his magnum opus, a terrific mm. performance during Game 7 of the World Series. You already know what happened next. Hinch brought in Will Harris, who gave up a home run in game six and did it again in game seven. The Nationals went on to win the game. I'm happy for our nation's capital and my good friend Tony Kornheiser, who I was told stayed up through most of the game. Congratulations, Tony. <laughs> but my night was ruined. I tuned in to see Zach Grinke complete a journey that started 15 years ago in Kansas City when I was a sports writer at the Kansas City Star. We had a columnist at the Star named Joe Posnanski. He wrote these beautiful stories about a 20-year-old quirky pitcher who might be the right-handed Sandy Koufax. Posnanski's prose made everyone in Kansas City believe Grinky had the potential to be the greatest of all time. His stories would go on to explore Grinky's battles with depression and anxiety and Grinky's desire to be a Babe Ruth-like slugger more than a Koufax-like pitcher. Grinky's one of the most interesting stories in sports. He is the most talented pitcher I've ever seen. He won the Cy Young Award in 2009. He eventually bolted Kansas City in pursuit of championships and huge paydays. He's bounced around from Milwaukee to Anaheim to Los Angeles to Arizona and this year at the trade deadline to Houston. Last night he was dominating the most important game of the 2019 season. He'd reached the pinnacle. And then A.J. Hinch emerged from the dugout and brought in Will Harris. Who the hell is Will Harris? Hmm. And what's he doing in my Zach Grinky movie? That game last night was like watching Uncle Jimmy and oh. the Blue M&Ms replace Morgan Freeman and Tim Robbins in the final <laughs> scene of Shawshank. Ah. LeVar Arrington and TJ Hushmanzada are back. Time now for Darnell's question of the day. Darnell, take it away. Darnell. Yes, sir. Let's move to a guy we talked about yesterday, Jets safety Jamal Adams who was upset that the Jets listened to the trade offer from him this week, saying, quote, my agent called me, he told me what was going on. It definitely hurt me. I hold myself at a high level. The Rams don't take calls on Aaron Donald. Yes, they do. The Patriots don't take calls on Tom Brady. Yes, they do. That's where I hold myself <laughs> in that regard. Now, guys, look, I look. thought y'all criticism on Jamal was unfair. Aww. The guy was just keeping it real about his feelings. He was hurt, Aww. and that's what he said. They were real on hurt. So I wanna, yeah, it was on his head, TJ. So I want to know, what exactly is the problem? All right. Look, for me, I'm I'm old, <laughs> and I just like it better when men used to keep their feelings inside and tell it to their wife or their mama. Tell it and, to and them? Leave, yeah. Or don't tell them at all? <laughs> don't or tell don't, them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They, they, I, they, I, they I discuss. They I'm spoke hurt. with other things back yeah, then when I, they held it in. I mean, uh, I'm just saying. But. I'm hurt. What you heard about, man? I, I, I'm, I'm just—it's mm. just too soft for me, and I just don't want—I don't want to hear about what soft. you heard about. You said oh, soft with two Fs, too soft. <laughs> All right. You give him a T, soft. <laughs> All right, for me, it's not because of age or anything. He's just out of touch with reality. He's acting like they're in a real relationship. Y'all in a business relationship. Nobody cares about how you feel, bruh. And this is how I, I, I really take it in. If someone walks up to you and say, "Hey, how you doing?" What are you supposed to say? Fine. 
If you ever answer that question for real, like, you know what's going on? I have all this going on. Man, <laughs> trapping and they don't want man what the hell wrong with you, dog? I just they wanted to hear, hear fine. We're playing football out here. Fine. Be fine. Get your check. Ball out. All right, he on. said better what I want. Right. <laughs> but we, we want our athletes to be honest and transparent. We do? Do we? Yeah, you do. <laughs> and But About he, he's a young player. And so... What you just said, it's a business. Yes. He was just taught that now. Oh, it's a business. When you come from college, you don't approach it as a business. Mm. You play football, you love football, you've been playing it your entire life. Now he's been introduced to the business side of football. When you meet with somebody and they tell you, you're a cornerstone on this team, you're not going to be traded. That is not what they told him. Well, that's what he said. No, he and told so them... He didn't want to go anywhere. <laughs> now, for him to say his feelings are hurt, yeah. I don't see the problem with it. And, mm. But I also don't see the uh, the team would be doing the team a disservice if they don't look at every avenue to make the team better. Mm. And so for him, he should look at it as a positive. There's another team that wants me, but I understand him being hurt. He wants to be there. He didn't want to leave. His feelings were hurt. Not a big deal for me. Now he won't talk to no, the no, GM no. and yeah. maybe won't what be you there said was yeah. Stop it, TJ. I grew up how you grew up. Don't show any emotion. Hold it in. I honestly believe it's a sign of strength to be able to cry and express yourself you publicly go, than it is talk to hold it in. Hold on. That's not what talk we're talking about, about here. Yes, we are. That's no, not what we're talking about. about. No, no, no. <laughs> that's a sign of strength. You can show emotion, but the proper emotion to the context. So when nobody said you can't, look, if you lose a game, cry. Go ahead, bro. I'm not tripping on that. But when you start saying stuff like that, this is somebody who used to date TJ and said, don't break up with me. But I'm do your you wife. Think do you think no, if you this wait. comes up again in his career, he would he have these same type He's of emotions? He's already talking no, about he, he may not want to play in New York anymore after this. They bad. <laughs> they almost Oh, but they weren't bad when he wanted to be a cornerstone? They almost No, not anymore. <laughs> yeah, hey. they okay. yeah, they were. Yeah, they were. You ask your, you your girlfriend, hey, man, somebody told me you texting your ex. No, nah, I ain't texting him. That's a lie, baby. And then he put on Instagram the screenshots. Oh, where you go? So you say I'm a cornerstone of the team. I'm here. And then I hear behind my back, you doing this. Facts. Just be honest with me. Be transparent with yeah, me. Yeah, That's I it. Like, this is why I Thank like you. college real sports real more than I like pro sports. And, and for him, for him, I don't have what, a what, what, What's the difference in college? Well, I, I like, no, like college. For, well, for me, for my college experience. They tried to run it, me off the team. <laughs> um, well, everybody has different experiences. Yeah, and that's why ahead. I said that's why I like college sports. <laughs> I didn't say me and you with go like ahead, college go ahead, sports. Go but, ahead. But, but I look at it as... I don't have a problem with him saying this because the loyalty factor in all of these things. I look at okay, and, and just 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 bear I'm with me. I'm listening, but it hurts. just bear with me I'm for with for, for a moment. Oh. When you see that man go out sensitive. there and and I'm a sensitive guy, I know. new haircut, I can, I know. so I can I can sympathize. If I crack a with joke him. about him coaching football, he goes I can into sympathize. A I can sympathize with Jamal Adams. I'm hey. If if I'm out there and I'm I'm putting my body on the line in these games, Very I'm tender. coming to work every day, ready to work, and I'm 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 putting that effort into it, and it shows in the results that I'm getting, and. <laughs> and I feel as though that those things are not being valued. It's not appreciated. The, the right way. It's not being appreciated. Because it's in the wrong context. I, I'm in still, the wrong well, place. I, I mean, but if his context is basing it upon this is what I bring to this organization and, and this is what I'm trying to achieve with this organization, no one should ever really be upset if you don't have a franchise player ever again. No one should be upset if you don't have a team that isn't full of, of mercenaries as opposed to the player. That's not I, right. I grew up in a day and age where free agency didn't exist when I was a fan of the game. I watched Mean Joe Green and L.C. Greenwood and, and Dwight White and all those guys come together and year in and year out play for a team, and they represented a city. So now we're getting to a point of where you're not even allowed to have emotions as it applies to your connection with the city. The Curly you W's... made a good point. The Curly W's just no, won... The, they, they just won, so the, they just won the, the World Series. I couldn't be more happier. I don't even associate with the Redskins all like that. And I couldn't be more know. happier. You know why? Why? Dan Snyder said you was kind of tender, man. Well, Dan, Dan, <laughs> Dan said I couldn't. Dan said I wasn't allowed to legally. He said you're too seasoned up here. Hey, but, 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 but look, tender. but that was my connection with the city is the reason why I'm excited for, for Bobby Brown had a song about you. What did it say? Tenderoni. Tenderoni. <laughs> Come on, man. Joined now by Fox Sports NBA analyst Jim Jackson and USA Today NBA writer Mark Medina. Let's move to the NBA where the season isn't even two weeks old and Kawhi Leonard is already on a load management plan. 
Sitting out as the Clippers fell to the Utah Jazz last night, unlike most superstars, Kawhi has made it pretty clear he doesn't really care what anybody thinks about him, whether he's skipping games early in the year or doing his best to shy away from any kind of media attention. All right, the question here is, is Kawhi's load management a bad look? And I want to add the caveat. He's got a really different approach to the media after games, they're waiting an hour for him, yeah. and they're kind of frustrated. He's 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 not trying to make friends with the media. He's letting his play do all the talking. Yeah, um, he's always done that in terms of relationships, and now the media coverage, he's letting his play do the talking. This is not a bad look for Kawhi Leonard. Uh, one, it worked out pretty well for him last year. Ultimately, they won a championship with him load managing. Two, the path to the finals does not have to go through a number one seed. Got some stats here. <laughs> More than half of the NBA finalists over the last decade were not number one seeds. Oh, LeBron made it to the finals eight seasons in a row and was only the one seed twice. Ooh, and we saw a three seed and two four seeds. Point being, Clippers, look, just get to the dance and try and be in the top four, obviously, for home court advantage. Beyond that, this is just a story that doesn't really land on the court in terms of what you need from your star, especially when he's carrying the load with Paul George being absent. Yeah, I don't think this is a bad look for Kawhi in terms of his health. He's made it clear, as well as the Clippers, that he doesn't have any lingering effects from that injury in San Antonio with the quad injury, right? Yeah. So this is not like last year where Toronto load managed him because of that. But I think I have a problem this early in the season that the Clippers are preemptively seeing him out as opposed to, hey, you have a minor injury, let's just be cautious. So I have a problem with that from a fan perspective, but it's totally fine as far as what this means for Kawhi's health and what the Clippers' end game is, which is having a championship here in June. But, but it's tough because as a player, again, I'm that old guy. I love to play the game. Yeah. But I didn't log the minutes later in my career like Kawhi is doing. So I get it from a load management perspective. But it's two areas you got to look at from a TV perspective. To me, if you're going to have load management in NBA, and Adam Silver talked about this last year, if it's a national televised game, don't do it, okay? If it's a road game, don't do it. Choose to do it at home because – you only go to be able to see Kawhi Leonard twice if you're Utah fans. Now you only get the chance to see him one. You don't know what's going to happen later in the season. So I get it from an organizational perspective of being able to have a guy play 65 games or so, be fresh at the end of the year to have a viable chance at a championship. But from an economic perspective, if I'm ESPN or TNT and I've signed this deal with the NBA to have the stars play outside of an injury, if you're injured, I get it. But – do me a favor. On these games that are on national TV, play your superstar. Yeah. Mm. And this is where you got to tip a hat to LeBron James. Because, again, there's this dynamic. LeBron and Kawhi sharing the Staples Center, sharing Los Angeles. I think this is going to be fascinating to watch all year in terms of one thing we can say about LeBron, he was willing to carry the league mm -hmm. and to be the face of the league and to be the star that drove, that drove ratings. Kawhi in San Antonio, Kawhi in Toronto, he's out here in L.A., the number one or number two market, the most important market, I think, in the NBA, without question. Is he willing to take on the responsibility of being that guy? He, so far, he seems to be saying, no, that's not good business for the NBA. Well, for me, I, I don't always have to take on what you give me. Mm -hmm. You know, just being respectful. Like, there, we were just talking about uh, Zach Greinke, and, and every time he's a free agent, they say, which team are you looking at? He's like, the one that pays me the most. That's <laughs> great. You know, there was a moment when we saw Lonzo Ball when he was done at UCLA, and they were like, so you got to take time to talk to your family. He said, no, I'm leaving. I'm peace. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> sometimes when you're just so deadpan, matter of fact, I love that. And that's who Kawhi is. He's just like... I'm here to play basketball, and then I'm going to leave. And you guys want to throw everything else on me in terms of garment and responsibilities? Good for you, but it's not great for me. Yeah, and, and, uh, and, all right, we need to move. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, to a couple of guys who made their presence known last night, mm -hmm. Joel Embiid and Carl Anthony Towns, who were both ejected after getting into a fight during the Sixers win over the T-Wolves. Embiid looked like he enjoyed himself, and after the game, he sounded like he was ready to, for more. How much talking was there going on between you two during the game? Was there a lot of that? Uh, well, first of all, I ain't no bitch. Uh, <laughs> so, nah, there was not a lot of talking. 
uh, I mean, uh, you would kind of happen out of nowhere. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, I just did what I had to do. And uh, I was just, you know, trying to control myself. Um, and, you know, it happens. But it's basketball, you know. Um, that's, a, that's what I'm good at. I like to get in people's mind. All right, the process versus Big Cat, good or bad for the NBA? Bad for the NBA. I will go horrible, but uh, I'm not <laughs> trying to give you hyperbole, but it's really bad. One, the NBA game has grown to new heights. Uh, let's just talk about in, in the economy of the NBA. When it was yesteryear NBA, let's just say when Jordan retired. Before that, it was the bad boys. and Loved it. Rough and, rough and tough. You loved it, right? Mm. And we loved it, too, to the tune of $2.7 billion in the economy. But right now, it's $8 billion plus. Why? One, we see the skill level evolve. You see 6 through 10 on a team now. That guy would have been probably a star player of some level back in those days because it's just athleticism and skill level. But let's not forget what sports are. People at home want to watch sports to live vicariously for a sport, an athlete, an endeavor that you can't do. Last time I checked, anybody could roll around on the court and fight and toss and do Kurt Rambis fouls. So <laughs> this is not taking me to new excitement levels, and that's bad for a sport. When you can sit at home and say, I can do that, that's not good for the sport, and that's why that wasn't good. I don't think it's bad in, in this respect because it's a one-off kind of thing. If it happened more of an occurrence, what well, we saw it all the time, in-game fights, mm. guys getting ejected, then it would be a bad look for the NBA. I think the bad look comes from the fact of the next game or two if they're suspended. Because now you have two superstars who are not on the floor playing the game that we love, but also the fans get a chance to see them. But don't they need consequences? You have to no, no, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. If they're suspended, yeah. that's, a good, that's a bad look okay. for the NBA from a per personal perspective because your stars are not on the floor. Well, okay, you know, for me, back in the day, it was kind of, you know, guys are going to get into it and tussle. That's what you expected. The times have changed in regards to the game itself, not as physical. And what happened in Malice in the Palace, you don't want to see anything like it. But every now and then, tempers are going to flare. As long as it doesn't get out of hand and fans are not involved, guys are still going to be able to do that. Yeah, I think it was fun and good for Philly fans. They were loving Joel Embiid. It felt like a pro wrestling match over there. But for the league, there's going to be suspensions. I don't uh, buy Ben Simmons' explanation that he was trying to play the role of peacemaker. He got Carl Anthony Towns in the headlock. I don't think the NBA is going to agree with his version of events. So no. he's going to get suspended there, <laughs> right? But I don't think it's going to linger over. This story will be forgotten about in a few days. But they need to have as many star players available mm -hmm. for games because the ratings are down. The load management situation, the China controversy, the fact that Steph Curry is now hurt. Mm. All those, Zion Williamson, all those games that were scheduled on national TV are going to go down. So they need to have as many teams with star players available, and this only hurts that. I, I'm going to go good, and I, good to great almost. Mm. The, the NBA for the last, what, 10 years is all about super friends, and mm -hmm. I want to go play with my buddy and <laughs> blah, blah, blah. These guys want to compete against each other. Big Cat in the process, don't like each other. Philadelphia is kind of feeling itself like, hey, we're supposed to be a team that's respected. And I, I, I love the, that they even care this much mm -hmm. to wrestle around and tussle. Ben Simmons, a level of toughness, and again, he deserves to get suspended. I don't, but these guys actually care. And so I, I kind of, I like that, and I like the fact that they don't like each other. I'm going to pray for you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, I, 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 we have to evolve in our thinking. One, we have to remember out-of-bounds fights don't mean that you really compete and care as much as out-of-bounds fights is suggesting. We always do that. We always conflate the two. Oh, man, he really cares. Cause why? Because he was fighting when it didn't count. Like, I, I want to stay within the lines to see how you really care about something. But the evolution of this is kind of like early UFC. Like, basketball used to be, oh, no holds barred. Kurt Rambis going down and slamming people, bad boys. Awesome. Uh, UFC number one was awesome, too, until you realize we shouldn't eye gouge, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> maybe we should have some right, rules, right, right, some right. governing <laughs> bodies. And it's now a multi-billion dollar industry because... Sometimes you got to have some governing principles. All right, let's move to the big news out of Golden State, whose season just went from bad to worse with Steph Curry breaking his hand during their loss to the Suns last night. Yeah. There's still no timetable 
for the former MVP's return, who is still waiting to find out if he needs surgery. But Steve Kerr, Draymond Green, and company will now have to muddle through an already down year without their best player. <sighs> Question here is, trust Steve Kerr to rebuild the Warriors? Uh, I trust him. Uh, I mean, look, it's five. Oh, Mark Jackson's coming back? Oh, oh really? Did Mark Jackson? <laughs> <laughs> Gary West is leaving the Clippers? Oh, did any coach in NBA history win more than five, uh, more games in their first five years than Steve With Kirk? With Mark Jackson and huh? Steve J. West's work? Well, you yeah, come on. Mark, oh, set, Mark well, set it up. Now, don't, don't take away from Mark we're Jackson. We're not doing now. that. Don't, but, don't well, do hey, that. Hey, hey. <laughs> don't do that. It's something about finishing the work, which we know okay, is Okay, well, now he's got to rebuild and do his this own. This is not a rebuild. Stop, re stop naming this the wrong way and properly. This is not, you don't have a hammer, you don't have nails, you don't have wood. You're not rebuilding Jack. You're waiting for the doctor to sign the permits for you to proceed. This is a gap year. This is a red shirt year for an organization. They have no assets right trust there. Trust him in the red shirt year? <laughs> <laughs> I trust you and I in the red shirt year. All of us go up there and do it. But no, this would be inappropriate to put this responsibility of doing something with this team with the lack of star power this year. Well, here's the thing. Mark Jackson's not coming back. Joe Lakeup uh, had a reason that he didn't see eye to eye with him, right? Mm. They totally support Steve Kerr. Now, let's not get it twisted. He is not as good of a coach as he was the previous few years because he doesn't have the four all-stars, right? But I think that... Steve Kerr's temperament helps with some of these young players where he makes them feel empowered. Now, are any of these young guys going to be good? That remains to be seen. But to your point, Marcellus, it's all about bridging for next season to yeah. get Steph Curry and Klay Thompson healthy. Draymond Green will be back. Maybe they trade D'Angelo Russell. And then, assuming that this season's loss, they're probably going to get that draft pick. It's protected mm -hmm. 1 through 20 yep. as part of yep. that signing trade. So they could be right back in the mix as early as next season. The question should be, can – Bob Myers rebuild the Warriors mm, okay. because that's where it's going to ultimately become because the pieces you need to add are on management and front office. Steve Kerr can only coach the product that's given to him. Now, he has to figure out with these young guys how to develop them, whether long-term they can be a part of Steph and Clay and also Draymond to see if they fit. That's his job. I think his job also, too, is to figure out with these young guys who are now in the lineup is how do we play and be competitive? That's coaching right now. Usually during the course of the year, you know this. Coaches manage minutes, egos, and injuries during the course of the year. Once you get into playoffs, that's when you really dig into the X's and O's. But Steve Kerr has got to flip that a little bit. Mm. He's going to have to figure out how to make these guys and get these guys to buy in to be able to be competitive on a nightly basis. And then when you get your core back next year, whatever Bob Myers chooses to do in regards to bringing in other talent, whether you trade D'Angelo, that's when okay. they get back to it. So let me ask that. Mm -hmm. Do you think they're going to be a hot mess the rest of this year? This is a team that's spoiled, hot mess by, like what? spoiled by its success that they earned. Mm -hmm. I'm not taking nothing away from them. Yeah. But now have to deal with a year where they're really not going to be – I don't think they're going to be competitive this year. I think they're going to mail it in. No, I don't, mail it in like how? Like not, maybe not Effort. playing Draymond? No, no, just effort. No, I, I, no, was... I think the young guys, they have something to prove because you've got a team full of young guys that, one, want to be back next year. Want, two, maybe somebody else in the NBA is looking at. So when you have that kind of motivation, young guys want to go out there and prove. And now Steve Kerr, because of his demeanor and how he communicates with his players, are able to get to them like, look, we're playing for the bigger picture. Yeah. Each and every time you go on court, you got a chance to prove yourself. So it's not like you got a team of veterans who kind of already been there, done that. It's a lot easier for them to mail it in to me than it is when you have a group of young guys. Yeah, I think the only awkwardness here is they just opened Chase Center. Ah. $1.5 billion arena in San Francisco. Ouch. I think the fans are going to be there, but if there are blowouts, those tech investors are going to leave, right? <laughs> but the Warriors don't have to do anything grandiose and say, hey, we're going to tank. All they have to do is play who they have. Mark Slareth and LeVar Arrington are back. Let's move to Cleveland, where Baker Mayfield's behavior is becoming a cause for concern. The emotional quarterback stormed out of a media session yesterday after a testy exchange with a reporter, and now people are comparing him to another quarterback who was drafted with a lot of hype but flamed out in spectacular fashion, Ryan Leaf. Leaf, for his part, addressed the comparison yesterday. I had a lot of swag 25 years ago, right? Coming yeah. out of coming out of college, it's, it's it's all what you do with it from Sunday to Sunday. We know what he can do on the football field. I think a lot of people understand that they've seen it. It's what you do from Sunday to Sunday that sets you apart. Sam Darnold and that Jets team are struggling a lot right now, but you don't you don't hear these things with 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 him because he just he doesn't give you the ammunition. That's the difference. You have yeah. a choice with that. When things are going good. 
people are ready to jump on board with it. But when th- things are going bad, you have to understand that you've also set yourself up for some, you know, constructive criticism. All right, Marcellus, is this the right comparison? Fair to compare Baker Mayfield to Ryan Leaf? Yes, it is. And, and I give you the comps that, that shows that this may be a parallel situation. Ryan Leaf may have been the greatest implosion we've seen in terms of talent and that eroding right before our eyes. Now, why am I saying this about Baker Mayfield? Now, I may be early to this party, but I do see some parallels. What's happening is his implosion. We saw it with the reporter. We've seen it in other incidents throughout this year. What he's going through is their team's chemistry is being affected. And and chemistry is trying to learn that unspoken language with teammates, whether it's you and your D-line mates. So I get to a point where I don't even have to say anything. You know what I feel. But let's not forget about the chemistry, unspoken language, and that dialogue. It could be good and it could be bad. What's happening now is that Baker Mayfield has realized that because of his coach's lack of acumen, scheme, and philosophy, he's not properly supported and put in the best positions. What's happening also is those eye stares and, and, and the, the glare you would get from Odell Beckham is read differently. Odell Beckham is not even a Pro Bowl player anymore. He has one touchdown on the year. Jarvis Landry, who used to quietly – go toe-to-toe with Odell Beckham in terms of NFL pace setting is now just a normal player. What's starting to happen is Baker Mayfield is realizing that things are crumbling around him. Now, the parallel to Ryan Leaf is me being a former San Diego Charger and hearing the stories of how it caved in on him and it caved in around him. Mm. That's what's happening right now. He's starting to read the situation differently. Is, Is Baker Mayfield going to pull himself out of this situation? It all depends on his mental makeup. But I do see this situation eerily reminding me of what happened to Ryan Leaf, and it happened fast in San Diego. I I, you know, I think it's a fair comparison because of the emotional lack of maturity that we're seeing from Baker Mayfield. And as a quarterback of a franchise, you're a franchise quarterback, and you have to conduct yourself as a franchise quarterback. That means you have to live a lifestyle. (laughs) You know, one time I'm, I'm interviewing Jimmy Garoppolo before I call one of his games, and I said, what did you learn from Tom Brady? And he said this, and quarterback position is different than any other position on, on, on the football field. He said, Tom Brady taught me that playing quarterback is not a job, it's a lifestyle. It's your lifestyle. And, and the bottom line is when you show that immaturity, think of it, juxtapose him to Deshaun Watson when Deshaun Watson was asked a question about coverage a couple of weeks ago. Mm. And he broke it down, and he said, I'm not trying to make you, like, I'm not trying to make you feel like you don't know what you're seeing, but let me just explain to you Mm. how this game is. Like, there was a respect, and there was an educational process that went went on, and and I think everybody grew in respect of how Deshaun Watson handled and diffused the situation. You don't handle or diffuse any situation. What you create is more controversy for yourself, and guess what happens? Therefore, it leaks over to your team, and now your team has to answer a bunch of questions about your maturity level. Mm. I, I don't agree that they're comparable, and, and, and the reason why I go in a different direction with, with the comparing those two is because of the amount of expectation that is being put on Baker Mayfield and what's connected to that versus the amount of pressure that was put on uh, Ryan Leaf and what was connected to that. You look at that team, that was a 5-11 and 11 team the first year that, that uh, Ryan Leaf played for, for the Chargers. And he didn't, I mean, name me, name me a, a star worth on, on that roster that he had to throw the ball to. He had Natron in the backfield. Mm-hmm. So he had, he had a decent little running game. He had Big Riley on the line of scrimmage. They had a decent little run game. But the staple of that team was what? Their defense. defense. Right? Mm -hmm. What do you have in Cleveland? You're putting you're putting the the pressure and the weight and the expectation based off a reputation of the quarterback, the receivers, and the rest of the names of these high, uh, you could say somewhat high profile athletes that they added to this roster, which they were calling, if people don't have a short memory, a super roster, a dream team roster coming into the season. So now you've put Super Bowl expectations on this team. you put Super Bowl expectation on Baker Mayfield. The amount of pressure going into this with the amount of, of 
exposure going into Baker Mayfield season is far exceeding anything that Ryan Leaf had that, ever experienced. That's true. It's a good point. Oh, oh, I disagree with that, but I'm going to let you go. Yeah. Well, the, <laughs> to me, the common denominator between Mayfield and Ryan Leaf is just attitude. And that's what Ryan Leaf is talking about. It doesn't matter how much talent you have if you don't have the right attitude. Attitude will control behavior, results, the whole nine yards. That's why I'm so opposed to people that come out with a victim mentality or feel like they're being picked on or want a bunch of sympathy. Baker Mayfield thinks like the whole world's against him. Every, and he looks for people to be against him. He would get much further if he came out with a positive attitude and started looking for the good things. But it's hard to convince people of that. But but trust me, that's the proper mindset and attitude. But that's what's this. propelled him to where he is. Yeah. And, and I Marcel is always, you always say you respect too. that about but him. But this is, this one, let's not have uh, short-term memory uh, issues when we're talking about Baker Mayfield now and then let's go back with Ryan Leaf who he was. It's not just who you are, it's who you're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. That's what expectations are. Sure. Ryan Leaf was always compared to who? Peyton Manning. Yep. From day one, year one, year two, hey, we could have had that, but this is our reality. So this is where Baker Mayfield's going wrong. He's showing up to the party saying, I got it, and then when everyone shows up with him, they realize you ain't got it. I thought you arrived. I thought you were ready for this situation. Thought you could be professional and live that lifestyle as a quarterback. And here's an example of where we saw Ryan Leaf go wrong. Ryan Leaf, after another loss, lands off the plane. Limos out front of the plane after another loss and says, guys, where are we going? Let's party. And that made the teammates look at him like, are you really about this? It doesn't take that kind of situation for making teammates look at you sideways. Have you not been there before with a coordinator change, a, a personnel change, and you're sitting there like, my job just got way harder mm -hmm. because of you. Mm -hmm. Guess what they're doing in that locker room right now? And I don't care if they come on record and agree or not. They're looking at Baker Mayfield like, you making our jobs way harder because of you. And that's why he's starting to And people are going to lose their jobs because of the, 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 the spotlight that's on Baker Mayfield and it, what they're able to accomplish. But, again, when I look at Leaf, Leaf is in an entirely different – he was in an entirely different set of circumstances and scenarios when he was in San Diego. And I find that hard to put Baker Mayfield no in No question about that. that. Here's what I'll say about the attitude thing. I think a lot of times – we mistake the things that make us successful. We think it's, oh, it's because I had this attitude or I took on the world, blah, blah, blah. Nah, that really wasn't it. Lincoln Riley and that offensive mm. system and your talent are what are the reason you were successful. All that little extra attitude and <laughs> I'm me against the world may have been actually holding you back a little wow, bit. Man. So I, I'm t we make a Good lot point. of mistakes. It would be like me sitting there saying, you know what, you know why I was a successful sports writer? because I was overweight. Mm. And I'd be like, no, 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 it really wasn't that. Right. If you had lost some weight, you'd have been even more if successful. You a successful <laughs> eater, then right. I agree with you. Yeah, so, yeah. I don't know I'm how it correlates to writing, well, though. Again, you know? It just, you, pe we just think, anything that we were doing while we were successful right. was part of our success. That's not the case. Yeah. I, I, don't I, don't that. That. I don't believe that. All right, Darnell, what's going on with the Super Six this week? Oops. Yes, sir, Terry Bradshaw's actually adding a bonus contest on Sunday for the Texas and Jaguars game in London which kicks off at 9.30 a.m. Eastern Time on NFL Network. Make sure you download the Fox Sports Super 6 app and play for free for a chance to win. But one of the questions for tonight's Thursday Night Football Super 6 game is, who will win between the 49ers and Cardinals? And by how many points? Whitlock Marcellus, who you got? I talked a lot of smack about Jimmy G earlier, mm. but not right now. <laughs> uh, San Francisco's winning big tonight, 27 to 17. Mm. 49ers win, not big. 31-23. Cardinals got a little team out there. Uncle Jimmy's here to help us talk about our approval ratings for Jimmy Garoppolo. But first, uh, you know, <laughs> you know. <laughs> it's Halloween. Who's your big dummy of the day? Should give it to yourself. Look at that. My, my big dummy of the day go to the person that said, uh, you call your girlfriend to break up only to find out she your wife. <laughs> I ain't saying Bro, like I don't that. know what kind of weekend you had. <laughs> she talking about she but you don't need money. you don't need to call somebody for a breakup. You need a lawyer. <laughs> All right. Let's talk Jimmy G string. Oh. We'll lead the 49ers against the Cardinals tonight on Thursday night football. Jimmy G will be up against another high that, profile quarterback, rookie Kyler Murray. Mm. Marcellus, yeah. any chance Kyler 
outsides Jimmy G tonight. There's a slight chance, and I'm going to give you guys a fun fact when you're at that sports bar. Do you know that the Cardinals have beat the 49ers eight straight? I know what y'all going to say. Oh, but they're undefeated, and this is a different thing. Still, eight straight. Really? And Shanahan has never beaten the Cardinals. So, mm, there's a chance. Maybe this is the, the wild card. Maybe this is the wild card game. Wow. Yeah. Isn't that a fun fact? I'm, that's a hell of a Look fact. Look at you. Wow. <laughs> He's like, I don't know what to say right now. Neither do I. Oh, my God. All right, Uncle Jimmy. <laughs> you got any thoughts about uh, Jimmy G-string? I was kind of hard on him in the A block. Mm. My... My, 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 my mama said that <laughs> if, if you give a man enough rope in life, <laughs> he'll think him a cowboy. Well, and yeah. he'll hang himself before it's all over. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's what's happening to you right now, nephew. Uh -oh. Me. Uh -oh. <laughs> Me. Uh -oh. yo, 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 your life done become an open book. <laughs> <laughs> and it ain't so one copy. <laughs> <laughs> you, you live in a glass house. But don't nobody want to look in it. <laughs> now, now, according to your Whitlock. Oh, yeah. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Which is evident that you don't possess the ability to keep nothing to yourself. I done begged you a thousand times. <laughs> now, you said you was traveling down the road of life, <laughs> and you found a pot of gold. And I'm sure there was gold chicken McNuggets if you told the whole story. <laughs> Golden Corral. <laughs> and you found them with a fork in the middle of the pot in the middle of the road. I said something like that. Yeah. And you lost all ambition for life after that. <laughs> Dang, okay? That's not what I said. Dang. Look, man, that's not what happened to Jimmy G. Hmm. Jimmy G is a real G, if you feel me. <laughs> Look, man, it ain't no secret. It ain't no secret to the fact that Uncle Jimmy like his full figure girls. Yeah, that's, yeah. yeah. Mm. Okay, it ain't no shame to my game. Yeah. Hell, my contractual demands reflect such. <laughs> Like a big. Look here, man. Let me explain this to you. I need me somebody not to just put gas in my car, <laughs> but somebody that can push the car if it ain't got no gas in it. <laughs> you feel <laughs> Dang. Mm, yeah. See, Jimmy oh. G signed a big contract and immediately got them big racks. <laughs> but they already paid for it. <laughs> See, Dang. you hating on Jimmy G for having that double D porn star girlfriend. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, yeah. Nephew, you mad because you bought your girlfriend some double Ds <laughs> thinking you was going to turn her into a porn star, <laughs> but instead, she's somewhere hanging out with Jamie Foxx. Talking about... <laughs> yeah. Now, look, look, hold on. Now, I ain't saying she a gold digger, <laughs> but her bank account's like your belly and it keep on getting bigger. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes. Huh? Ain't wow. Lying there. Uh, huh? Ain't lying there. I ain't that. saying she a gold digger. Feed <laughs> the baby. Get him the baby. But her bank account's like your belly and it keep on getting bigger. <laughs> That's I had good. to just say that twice. Hey, all right, that was pretty good. Look, <laughs> I can I get that. to my approval rating? Nope. Now? We got to yeah. move on to something. Yeah, we're moving on. <laughs> got to get off to my it's approval rating. It's getting hot in here. <laughs> Yeah, I can take your clothes off. No, clothes. take your clothes. Keep your clothes. Oh, God, right. yeah. I've got Jimmy G. I've elevated him 15 points. As you should. I was very low on him uh, during the preseason. Yeah. Uh, but I've moved him up to a 53 and scout team. 13 job performance. Five in all-time greatness. Mm. 13 in character. What's Dropped up? a few points in authenticity. Yeah, what happened? Well, he's trying to pretend like he's taking the high road being a you know, be, getting carried by this team. I don't buy it. Uh, yeah. You, no win situation there. Yeah. If Jimmy G comes out flexing, then you're like, yeah. ah, see, you're going to hurt right. the team. So I got him as a role player, not much higher, but uh, respect to his record, respect to him leading this team and what they were before Jimmy G to what they are now, but still a role player in terms of his individual production. All right, the internet agrees with me. They got him at a scout team.